And uh, one more thing, too, as far as the gold and silver coins, any coin is better than a piece of paper. Yeah. Really. So the, the copper coins, the nickel, nickel coins, zinc copper, zinc copper colored coins, and any coin is better than, than a piece of paper. Because there will probably be a lot of things you can buy with those coins. And your silver coins will be very, very valuable. And there will probably be a lot of people who can't break them down and get change. Did you see the new law they passed to prevent people from taking nickels or pennies out of the country? No. $10,000 fine, five years in prison if you take more than $5.05 worth of nickels out of the country and they catch you. Right? Yeah, it's more than they can stop you if they check, like the little change buckets you have in your car or something. Yeah. They search that and they find some They're going to accuse you of trying to deface U.S. currency and yep. smelting it because there's more value in the nickel than the copper. Okay. Yeah, since 1981. Anything before 1989. Yeah, the Jesuits are busy. So what I'd like to do then is uh, kind of go back and review um, what the Jesuits have done in the uh, 17th, 18th, and 1900s. So, so that um, you will see a flow to that. And what I've tried to do in my book is make a flow so that I'm just not dealing with one issue here so it seems incomprehensible to the reader because they don't know the past and they don't know the future. So if you look at history as a flow of history, like a stream, you're walking, you're walking into it and you can see where it's coming from, you can see where it's going, then it's, it's much more discernible. If you're just getting in the stream and not knowing where it's coming from, where it's going, it doesn't seem absurd. So um, we'll continue on here with the Jesuits in the 1600s. In about 1600, the Jesuits decided to start what was called the reductions in South America. Now, the, the two or three greatest Catholic empires at the time were France, Portugal, and Spain. France, Portugal, and Spain. Um, especially Portugal and Spain, they were international shippers. Um, and they were opposing the Dutch and the English, who were Protestant. And they were international shippers. So it was a warfare between these Catholic and Protestant shippers on the high seas. Well, the Jesuits had access to the Portuguese and to the Spanish shippers. So what they did was, by the way, the Jesuits also had their own fleet. That fleet was called the Black Ships. And the Black Ships flew the flag of the Skull and Bones. And uh, in fact, you can see a Black Ship in the movie Shogun. Uh -huh. If you've ever seen Shogun. Yeah, but in Shogun, they portray the Jesuit as some guy who wanted to save the life of Will Adams, when in fact he was a bloody murderer. So what happens is the Jesuits. They, um, would you prefer if I just stood still? Is that what <laughs> no, he's having his own issues. <laughs> <laughs> he's dropping. So what the Jesuits have done is they, they then decided to start these reductions in South America. And these reductions were called, we would call them today kibbutz, or communes. But this whole concept of commune comes from the orders, comes from the religious orders. Because in the order, they were all equal, each according to his ability, and mm -hmm. each according to his ability, each according to his meaning. Right. And so this is exactly how the old Roman Catholic papal orders ran their particular closed societies. Mm -hmm. So communism, in fact, it's a Latin word. It comes from communist. It's a Latin word when the language of the word grow is Latin. So naturally we can see that communism originates from Rome. Wow. Now, <clears throat> communism was also the maxim that was employed by Sir Thomas More in his Utopia. Mm -hmm. Sir Thomas More's Utopia is communism. And any true historian of communism will tell you that the father of communism 
is Sir Thomas More. Mm -hmm. This is an undeniable link between Rome and communism as we know it today. Wow. The other thing is the Jesuits revived the, writer, the writings of Plato's Republic. Plato's yeah. Republic was dead. Nobody read that until the Jesuits decided to bring that back, start teaching in the schools because Plato's Republic is again communism because the state is supreme and the whole purpose for the individual is to enhance the state. And this is the doctrine of communism, this is the doctrine of fascism. Any of these isms where the state is supreme comes from Sir Thomas More's Utopia, Plato's Republic, and more important, the communist system employed by the orders during the Dark Ages. Okay, so when the Jesuits began their reductions, they started them in what we now know them, a country that we know today as Paraguay, also to a certain extent Brazil. They had 57 large reductions. Thompson says in his footprints of the Jesuits, they had 31. But this more recent book I have written by the Jesuits said they had 57. This, this uh, was the inclusion or incorporated about 300,000 slaves, Guarini Indians. They had ships going up and down the Parana River, I believe like 2,000 of them, something in that area. It was a huge commercial enterprise. On these reductions, they taught the natives, the Guarani Indians, to make violins, to make clocks, to uh, make hot, uh, tan hides, to put out tallow. The Jesuits were the discoverers of the Paraguayan herb, which was used extensively in Europe. The Jesuits were also the masters of the silver mines in Peru. So uh, they were the masters of really all of South America and the great wealth that they accumulated on the reductions, they put into international shipping and commerce. And they then deposited all this money into their banks in Europe. And then they used this money in their banks to finance wars against the Protestant nations. Mm -hmm. So the Jesuits had to work for the wealth that they had then. Now they created out of thin air. Sure. So it's much easier to destroy Protestantism, create a world that you want, and this fiat currency and credit that they exclusively have the right to issue. But back then they had to work for it, or rather they didn't work for it, but they made slaves work. Sure. So these reductions existed from about 1609 to, uh, 50, to 1767, a little over 150 years. And uh, these reductions were run on the maxims, as R.W. Thompson says, he was the Secretary of the Navy, and he was also involved in building the Panama Canal in the 1800s. And he said that these reductions were run pursuant to the doctrines of socialist communism as we know them today in 1894. Well, what were those maxims? Well, each according to his ability, each according to his need. So the Indians were given their food, their clothing, place to stay. Anything more than that went to the storehouse. So then out of the storehouse, they would send off to international commerce and trade with their black ships in port. But they didn't have the cooperation of the Spanish and the Portuguese. They ran this commercial enterprise themselves. They not only ran the Paraguayan reductions, they ran all of Central America and they ran all of Mexico. They were in charge of all the cattle breeding. They were the ones that brought processed sugar into North America. They were the ones responsible for uh, having all this uh, production of breads and grains. They had all the sheep, all the oxen, all the cattle. And a particular uh, Roman Catholic bishop complained to the Pope that they, we, all the other priests will be begging bread of the Jesuits if we allow this to continue. <laughs> so the Jesuits had these huge reductions, huge profits, and some of the maxims were these. One man, one vote. Hmm. One man, one vote is communism. There should never be one man, one vote. But that's what we got with the 15th Amendment. One man, one vote enthrones the papacy to rule your country. Because the voters should be the landowners. The voters should be the one who hold the property in the country. And if you don't hold land, you don't vote. Uh, so, they had one man, one vote. 
The other thing was they had universal suff suffrage and universal equality between men and women. Because the woman making the clock was just as valued as the man. Just as valued, so it was universal equality between male and females. This is another unbiblical position. The Bible teaches male supremacy and female subordination. That the male has the responsibility to the family to provide, and she is subordinate at home with the children. Without children and a wife at home, you have no nation. Mm -hmm. All you have is one big corporation or one big ship on the water, mm -hmm. admiralty jurisdiction, where everybody's equal, everybody's pitching in to keep the ship afloat, and there's no distinction of rank and property. And this is one of the things Calvin attacked the Jesuits that they wanted to do, was to destroy every distinction of rank and property. So <clears throat> another distinction, another thing we want to talk about is that this whole idea of women's suffrage is unbiblical. Mm -hmm. Women do not belong voting. The political is for the men. Whenever a nation is under the judgment of God, you have women leaders right. and children. This is totally unbiblical. You say, well, there was Deborah and the prophetess and so on. That's because the men were so apostate, the Lord didn't have much to choose from. Whenever the Lord's involved in it, he chooses men to do it, the issue. Okay? So, we, uh, so the Jesuits have universal equality, universal suffrage, uh, one big pot together. All the maxims of communism as we know them today were perfected on the Jesuit reductions. Now, <clears throat> this, this incited all sorts of um, jealousy on the part of the Portuguese and the Spanish kings. Because look at these Jesuits. We've discovered now that after a hundred years they have these huge reductions. And they also taught the natives to never to speak Spanish. They were forbidden to speak Spanish or Portuguese. They could only speak their native Guarani Indian language. That kept them away from the Portuguese traders and the Spanish traders. The Jesuits also taught the natives that all white men had a devil in them. Now we see them, who's really behind teaching <coughs> hatred of a white race. They taught all white men had a devil in them, and if you caught one, to make sure you killed them by cutting off their heads, lest they should come to life again. And this is in Thompson's, The Footprints of the Jesuits, written in 1894. So the Jesuits are masters of inciting hatred of the dark races toward the white races. They did this all throughout the time of their reductions in South America. Um, they also had plenty of entertainment for the natives. They had songs and dances and festivals so that they would forget about their slavery. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's exactly what we have here. Hollywood. Hollywood. Dances, entertainment, and sports. They also had sports in the reductions. So that everybody's enamored with sports and Hollywood and entertainments so we can forget about our slavery. Mm -hmm. So we can forget about all that we've lost. Okay, they also had, uh, any, they had elections. They had offices that the Indians held, but only with the permission of the Jesuits. The candidates could only be Jesuit approved. So it's just like the American presidential race. The only candidates that are going to run will be approved by the Jesuit order, and anybody who's not is not going to be running, period. There will be no such thing as a grass mo grassroots movement of individual political leaders. That will not happen. The other thing is, these Indians, these natives, could not own any weapons, except when they would go out on a hunt, or except when they were being trained to fight the Spaniards and the Portuguese. Then they had organized armies to fight pardon me, the very Spanish and Portuguese kings that allowed the Jesuits in South America in the first place. So how the Jesuits ran the reductions in South America is exactly how they run the 50 states here. Every state in America is a Jesuit reduction. We all have the same money system. It's all the same laws because the Supreme Court with its evil federal question jurisdiction that came after the 14th Amendment now has the right to sit in review of every statute of every state 
when that was never, never, never the way it was supposed to be. The original Supreme Court had very limited jurisdiction. The case of Admiralty, uh, things on the high seas, if there was an issue with state between state, but never, never is the state law forbidding abortion constitutional or not. Mm -hmm. See, remember, Roe versus Wade springs out of federal question jurisdiction. Taking the Bible and prayer out of public schools springs out of federal question jurisdiction. Yes. But now, in a sense, the way they have structured public schools, it is federal. I mean, they're federal institutions. Well, yeah, they're federal institutions, but at one time, you know, they were the bulwark of our country. They were called the common schools. So the Jesuits, in converting them, <coughs> in converting them to what they wanted, they had to take the Bible out of public school. They had to take prayer out of public school. And, of course, they had to integrate them. But I'm saying they were unable to do that because of the financing by the federal government. Correct? Well, yeah, ultimately it became that. We remember in the 1930s, it wasn't that way. We still had gold and silver coins. We still had state, uh, for the most part, control over the state education. That only happens after FDR. After FDR and uh, the uh, Emergency War Powers Act of 1950, Internal Revenue Code of 1954, all that begins to change into this huge Holy Roman 14th Amendment American Empire, financial and commercial. So I uh, wrote the uh, Brown versus Board of Education decision, which was an evil, wicked decision. The blacks didn't want to go to school with the whites, and the whites did not want to go to school with the blacks. But the Supreme Court shoved this down our throat, forcefully integrating the schools that further destroyed the learning um, issues that were to take place in school. Because I went to school with blacks, and the issue there is who is the baddest? When that gets established, then you can begin to start to learn something. But that pecking order has to take place, so therefore you have fights and you have riots. You can't learn anything in school when you're fighting and rioting. And you can't learn anything in school when the girls are being preyed on. It doesn't work. So forced integration was one of the major bulwarks of destroying the public schools. And now, in Los Angeles, there are some Mexicans or Indian people there who are refusing to obey Brown versus Board of Education, and they're only taking their own kind into their school. And I say, they've got it right. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the, the, the natives there in the Paraguayan reductions, the Jesuits worked that experiment so that they perfected the tenets of communism, and then they put those tenets of communism on us by way of Supreme Court decisions, because now <coughs> what we have here is called judicial supremacy. The 14th Amendment. I'll, I'll deal with that in a little bit. The 14th Amendment <clears throat> did not give the black man the equal status with the white people. That did not happen. Mm -hmm. The black people were suckered into thinking that fighting for the northern uh, hordes, that they were going to secure freedom for themselves. That's what we're all brainwashed with in Hollywood and academia. That is not what happened. Before the 14th Amendment, white people were first citizens of their state, and thereby citizens of the United States. And the privileges and immunities of this subordinate and derivative U.S. citizenship included, included the Bill of Rights. That means that the first eight individual Bill of Rights listed acted as absolute limitations upon the power of the federal government. That means no matter how many people didn't want you to worship God according to the dictates of your conscience, the First Amendment protected you. It was a republic where law was king, mm -hmm. lex rex, the maxim of Rutherford's work. If all the people in the country didn't want you to own a gun, the Second Amendment protected your right to own a gun, period. Right. The federal government could never take them from you. Because remember, the Bill of Rights acted as limitations upon the power of the federal, not the state. Each state constitution had its Bill of Rights also that limited the power of the state. So the individual was shrouded with this protection, which is what we want, which is why we valued our citizenship, which why, why which American citizenship was so important and so unique. 
This is why no matter how many people wanted to deny you a jury of 12 people of your peers, the federal government could never deny that because it is secured by the Fifth Amendment. Okay, Fourth and Fifth Amendments. So we had these inalienable rights, these Bill of Rights that were part of our privileges and immunities of U.S. citizenship before the 14th Amendment. Well, Dred Scott came into play, and of course, the Jesuit temple coadjutor who rendered that decision was a Roman Catholic Chief Justice Taney, and it was a right decision, because the people who had citizenship were white, primarily. Uh, white. The blacks did not have citizenship. And so therefore, the 14th Amendment overthrew the Dred Scott decision, and it created a whole new citizenship. James G. Blaine talks about this in his book called Political Discussions. And he says, and James G. Blaine was an assassin, he was a murderer, he was involved in the murder of uh, uh, McKinley or, or uh, Garfield. James G. Blaine was called the Continental Liar of the State of Maine. He was a senator, a radical red Republican. And he said that what we intend to do is to make citizenship national. It's for the white man and the black man as well. So what the 14th Amendment did was this. It reversed the origin and character of American citizenship. And it made U.S. citizenship primary. And your state citizenship subordinate and derivative. And these are the legal words the Supreme Court used. It made U.S. citizenship paramount and dominant, quote unquote. And your state citizenship subordinate and derivative. And the state citizenship is a privilege of your U.S. citizenship. Mm. That's what they did. So what they did was is they destroyed George Washington's Calvinistic federal republic of these United Sovereign States. And what they made out of it was a Jesuit Holy Roman Empire. Okay? And by that, what I mean is this. Washington, in 1871, became incorporated. <coughs> Washington became Rome on the Potomac. It is the center city that controls the entire empire. The states became provinces. They are not sovereign states, just like Canada. In Canada, you have Ottawa and the provinces of Saskatchewan, British Columbia, Ontario, etc. That's all Roman government. In the Vatican, in, Roman, in the times of Roman Caesar, you had Caesar, and then all the countries were mere provinces, subject to the center city of Rome. So this is what the Jesuits did. And this is why the 14th Amendment was declared ratified twice. It was never really ratified. And in the creating of this new Holy Roman 14th Amendment Jesuit Empire, the Jesuits had centralized all power in Washington, and uh, the states were really subordinate to that, and the Jesuits had to fight a civil war for four years from 1861 to 65 to pull this off. And the southern elite men, for the most part, knew this is exactly what was happening. And that's why they fought so hard. They didn't fight to preserve slavery. And the North didn't fight to free the slaves. That is not true. By propaganda, the Gettysburg Address converted the war into a crusade. But the men who really knew what was happening knew that this was a fight to destroy both North and South, and on its ruins create this Holy Roman 14th Amendment, corporate fascist, socialist, communist, Jesuit empire. That would be used by the Vatican with its finances and its military to overthrow every country in Europe that had expelled the Jesuits in the 1800s. Yes? Um, I've heard rumors, I don't know if you can verify or not, that uh, when Abraham Lincoln ran for the second time, was extremely unpopular because of some of the drafts, and the people at that time did not understand how he won the election. They thought McClellan was a shoe in Do you think that was the first setup of a manipulated election? Or? Well, the Jesuits did not want Abraham Lincoln to be reelected because they knew that he was that he was against consolidation and centralization of power. But didn't McClellan want to give up? McClellan had a bad name. Remember, he was relieved of his command because he had this huge Yankee army that he refused to put in motion. 
And so he was relieved of his command. When McClellan, if he would have been really a good general and not so careful, it's not so cautious, he could have probably dealt a tremendous blow against Virginia. So McClellan was not in good graces with the North. He had a bad name, just like Pope and the others. So when Lincoln was reelected, the Jesuits knew what he was going to do. He was going to stop the Reconstruction because he wanted the southern states to come in on the same status that they had left the Union. So he acknowledged that they left the Union. He acknowledged that they had seceded. So he wanted them to come back with the same status. And so he was benevolent to the South. The same way with Seward. And so that's why the Jesuits knifed Seward in the attempted assassination of him. And that's why they shot Lincoln, because Lincoln was not going to allow consolidation. When Johnson comes to power, he resists consolidation. And he missed impeachment by one vote. Okay? They hated Johnson. But remember, Johnson was in the back pocket of the Jesuits. He had a daughter who was being raised by nuns in a convent. He was a high mason. He was a friend of B.F. Wiggett. B.F. Wiggett was a Jesuit in Washington, D.C. who orchestrated the assassination of Lincoln. I have a picture of him in my book. So Lincoln, although he did some very evil things in the name of saving the Union, like suspending the writ of habeas corpus and, and declaring martial law, uh, when in fact, if the southern states wanted to secede, they had every right to secede. If this is not a union by consent, why can't I leave? Exactly. Okay? And Virginia, Rhode Island, and New York all reserved the right to resume the powers that were delegated, granted them. Uh, that they had granted to Washington, if that Washington should ever be a threat to their existence. So if those three states had the right to secede, and by the way, Rhode Island was Baptist, Virginia was Baptist, and New York had a lot of influential Baptists, that whole bit of leaving this union was very important to our forefathers. And so if the southern states had the right to secede, and slavery was so evil and wicked, why then let them go? And if the way you treat your slaves is despicable, and if you're really doing all those things that we're told in Harry Beecher Stowe's word, Uncle Tom's Cabin, if that's really all true, which it wasn't, then God will visit you with his judgments. But go, go in peace. The issue was, that's not the way it was. And so, <clears throat> with the 14th Amendment, we have the centralization of power in Washington, and after that, Charles Chinnaquay, who would have been a priest for 25 years, said that when he went to Washington to inquire of the assassination of Lincoln, there was not one state in Washington that would dare to face that nefarious influence of the Jesuits and fight it down. Not one. Well, there was a Baptist, a Baptist Calvinist by the name of Thomas Harris, who was a general. And he was on the uh, military commission who tried the conspirators. And he writes several times in a couple of his books, the Vatican murdered Lincoln and they covered it up and he defended it till he died in the early 1900s. So there's always been some man of God to tell us what really happened during these times. So the 14th Amendment, that's what they did. They reversed the origin and character of American citizenship, made an empire out of the republic. And then, after they did that, they used the empire to fight the Pope's wars. The last men who ever fought for freedom in this country were the Confederates mm -hmm. of the South. They didn't know that Jefferson Davis was a traitor. They didn't know that Judah Benjamin was a traitor. They didn't know that Robert E. Lee was a traitor. They loved Stonewall Jackson, who was not a traitor and a godly Presbyterian. What they did know was they had to preserve their state rights to resume the powers that they delegated. So therefore, that was the last real war that men fought to preserve any kind of liberty. The northerners did not know they were destroying their country. They thought they were saving the Union. But obviously, they didn't have the brains enough to think, hey, we can save our Union by letting them secede. This is our Union up here. Maybe we can enter into treaty or some commercial contract with them. But let them go. I don't know. So in 1898, the Jesuits fomented our first internationalist war. 
Spanish-American War. And they used powers behind McKinley to do it. Now, McKinley was a Methodist, but he was a Mason. The moment you take that Masonic guard, you lose your power if you're truly a man of God. So McKinley was assassinated, and they not only shot him because he would have recovered from his shot, I cover this in my book, but they tortured him for many days until he finally died through surgery. The surgeon killed him, just like the surgeon killed Garfield. So we have the Spanish-American War. It lasts for a few months. And what happens out of the Spanish-American War? Every piece of Roman Catholic property was secured in this country through treaty. Because our government told Rome, you either send John Surratt back to us, and if you don't, we will confiscate every piece of Roman Catholic church property in this country. And so in 1867, because John Surratt was a real assassin of Lincoln, John Surratt was the one who called time and was working with John Wilkes Booth. It was John Surratt's mother who was hung, Mary Surratt, and three others. So they returned John Surratt, and Surratt was on trial. And of course, he had the greatest uh, Jesuit control lawyers around, and the Jesuits from Georgetown were busy frequenting the trial. And Surratt had two trials. And because they managed to get a Roman Catholic lady on the jury a couple of times, the jury was hung, and Surratt went free, and he died around 1916. So the Jesuits then, as they're building, using their empire, they're going to use this empire to fight their wars. Well, we have a problem in Europe. In 1880, France kicked out the Jesuits. Catholic France kicks out the Jesuits with their great Prime Minister, Leon Gabbard, who was amazing. Because now at this time, we have the second great Masonic schism, where the Jesuits now are not in control of all Freemasonry at this time. So Leon Gambetta expels the Jesuits out of France in 1880. In 1872, after the Jesuits had fomented the war to try to destroy Protestant Prussia, called the Franco-Prussian War, <coughs> Uh, yeah, the 1871 begins the, the Second Reich. The Second German Reich was Protestant. The Third Reich was Catholic. Catholic. So we have Bismarck, Prince Bismarck, who is a Mason, not a real practicing Mason. From what I read, he obviously knew the Lord. And Bismarck then is the one by whom the Kaiser, Wilhelm I, establishes the German Reich. In 1872, Bismarck, with the consent of the Catholics and the Protestants, expel the Jesuits from all of Germany. Major, major victory at this time. Germany begins to prosper. In 1873, Bismarck enfranchises 550,000 Jews who were not allowed to vote prior to that time. So now, because they're blessing the Jewish race, Germany begins to prosper. He's blessing the physical seed of Abraham, and they are also expelling the Jesuits. And by the way, the Jesuits blame the Jews for their expulsion in Germany. And I have a cartoon of it. So now Germany begins to prosper. And what do we have? We have steam engines. We have the production of cars. We have Germany being the greatest manufacturers in arms. We have Germany excelling all nations at this time because it's obeying two maxims. It's getting rid of those devil-worshipping Jesuits, and it's not persecuting its racial Jews. Well, this has to stop. So the Jesuits <clears throat> get a hold of Kaiser Wilhelm II. Kaiser Wilhelm II, what he does in 1890, is he relieves Bismarck of being the chancellor, the great statesman that he was. And Wilhelm begins to take over himself. Wilhelm readmits the Redemptorists, which are really the, Jews, the Jesuit lay brothers. He readmits the Je Redemptorists in about 1894. And in 1917, he readmits the Jesuits. Okay. Wilhelm built an abbey for the, for the Benedictines in Jerusalem in the 1890s. 
Wilhelm was a complete and total slave of the Jesuits, although he was betrayed by the Jesuits in the starting of World War I through his cousin, Nicholas II, the Tsar of Russia. Because the Jesuits have to destroy this Protestant life. We can't allow any Protestant nation to be powerful. That can't exist. Because every nation must submit to the temporal power of the Pope. So what happens? They start World War I. And before they started World War I, they had already built the Panama Canal. Because they built it for World War I. It started in 1909 and finished it just a few months before World War I begins, 1914. Because they're going to need that canal open for shipping during the war. As a result, <clears throat> World War I is ignited. Germany is blamed for it. Germany is, in 1916, there's a stalemate. France cannot succeed. 600,000 Frenchmen have been killed. Um, there's no way to beat the Germans. So what do the Jesuits do? They use their tool. Edward Mandel House, who is a Jewish Freemason, an advisor to Woodrow Wilson, and they use Joseph Tumulty. We don't hear much about him. Joseph Tumulty was the Knight of Columbus, who was Woodrow Wilson's personal secretary for 10 years. And no one could get near him, could see him in the executive mansion, now called the White House. Because remember, the presidential executive mansion had his name changed to the White House with Theodore Rex Roosevelt when it became an empire. So that no one can get near Wilson without Tumulty's permission. Wilson then is used to bring America in on the side of Britain against the Germans. When, of course, the Lusitania was deliberately sunk, it was a ship of war, there were Germans there on the, when they were manning, when they were getting them on, the Lusitania said, don't get on this ship, it's a ship of war, and it's going to be sunk by a German U-boat. So the Lusitania was used as a justification to bring America in on the side of Britain. And when that happened, it was a matter of time till the Germans would be defeated. When they were just defeated, that was the end of the Protestant Second Reich, and that was the end of Kaiser Wilhelm II. And because he'd been a good boy, they allowed him to go into Holland and there be under the protection of the Queen. That's how treasonous these monarchs were. So, what happens at Versailles? The stipulations at Versailles are so terrible, so awful, in, in blaming all the war guilt and the reparations on Germany, that what happens? They guarantee war in 20 years. Mm -hmm. Immediately, at the, shortly after Versailles, the Tool Society begins to ignite. Mm -hmm. The Tool Society is Masonic. Uh, Rudolf Sevendorf and... and uh, Others are key people in the Tool Society, and it's all Masonic, and Adolf Hitler's a member. Adolf Hitler was a high Freemason, a member of a covered lodge. We will never be told this by the average Freemason. Tool spelled T-H-U-L-E. T-H-U-L-E. Some say Tule. So they're immediately preparing to take up arms again, because you see it's an armistice. It's merely a session of hostilities. But the war is not really open, uh, done. And that's why I call this the Pope's Second Thirty Years' War. The first Thirty Years' War was from 1618 to 1648 in the attempt to destroy German Protestants. The Second Thirty Years' War was from 1914 to 1945, and it destroyed German Protestant Prussia. It destroyed Protestantism out of Prussia, and that it was the end of it. By 1946, Prussia was destroyed. In 1916, there is no way to beat the Germans, so the Jesuits use their James Cardinal Gibbons, the Archbishop of Baltimore, who's controlling Joseph Tumulty, the Knight of Columbus, who's controlling Woodrow Wilson, and brings America in on the side of the English. Germany's defeated, or was guaranteed by Versailles. Versailles was a Masonic Congress anyway. And uh, the German soldiers begin to train in Bolshevik Russia. <laughs> Nobody's ever told that. But you had some 8,000 German soldiers being trained in Stalin's Bolshevik Russia in, pre in preparation for starting World War II. So the Jesuits are busy now doing what? They're busy, they're busy creating Hitler and Stalin to work together. 
And what will they accomplish in this up and coming war? Well, remember, it never ends. We have the Russian Civil War from 1917 to 1920. Then we have Lenin's famine that he created, where he killed at least 10 million people, 5 million of them children. And then we have the, uh, the, uh, uh, the continual persecution of the Jews in Russia, because Trotsky killed the Jews with impunity. Um, then we have in the 1930s, we have the Spanish Civil War, when all the Republicans of France, of Spain, want to throw off the Vatican. And so they kick out the Jesuits in, 18, in 1931. So Spain kicks them out. Portugal kicks them out in 1902. Uh, France kicks them out in 1880. Germany kicks them out in 1882. In 1872. So we have all these European... Russia has kicked out the Jesuits since 1820. They're still banished. Until Lenin formally restores the Jesuit order in 1922. Okay. So the Jesuits have property to regain back in Europe. And they're going to use their British Empire like they used throughout the 19th century, and they're going to use the American Empire together to get back what they had lost in Europe in the 19th century. So they're using both these historic Protestant empires for the purposes of restoring the Pope's temporal power around the world. And all of us are told to go fight Hitler. Listen, Hitler was financed by the Dawes plan. Go home, check out the computer, D-A-W-E-S, the Dawes plan, and proceeded from J.P. Morgan. The Dawes plan financed the war debt of Germany and sold bonds to Americans to pay the war debt for Germany. And then Germany reneged on it, and it left all the Americans holding these worthless bonds. 1929. We'll deal with that. I should bring that up. So that the American builds the Third Reich. Now, let's go to 1922. Right, 22. Remember, the Pope had lost his temporal power in 1870. That means he didn't have the right to rule the world. King Victor Emmanuel II took the power. He became the king of the Kingdom of Italy, and he was later poisoned. His son was later shot, Umberto I. So they were busy killing off his family because he dared to say, I am king of Rome. You can have the spiritual power, but I have the temporal power. So what happens is, from 1870 to 1929, the Pope has no temporal power. So what the Jesuits do, then they bring Mussolini to power in 1922, and in 1929, he signs the Lateran Treaty. The Lateran Treaty. In this treaty, he creates the sovereign state of Vatican City, and he gives, he gives the papacy for all the monies they lost while they lost their temporal powers, reparations. He gives the papacy $90 million, almost $100 million of silver or gold dollars. It was back in 1929. Okay. The, real the real substance. You know what the papacy does with that money? They crashed the stock market here because there were three Irish Roman Catholics who were the big short sellers. Joe Kennedy, Tom Bragg, and Ben Smith. Three Irish Roman Catholic short sellers on Wall Street. It wasn't the Jews. It was the Irish Catholics that crashed Wall Street. Then after they crashed it, the only people that benefit are the ones that are liquid, right? The ones that have cash. The ones that have money to purchase the stocks when they're way up here, and then they go way down here and you can buy them for pennies, right? Not just worthless German bonds. Not just worthless German bonds. Okay, but what we have here, we have the whole manufacturing infrastructure in America. White Anglo-Saxon Protestant infrastructure that took centuries to, a century to build. They crashed the stock market, and then the Jesuits, using their money that they had gotten from Mussolini, walk into New York, and they buy everything with their hundred million dollars in gold. And where do they pay it to? Where does it go to? Why, it goes to their Federal Reserve Bank. Wow that they created in 1913. Yes? Speaking of that, um, you mentioned earlier the Titanic. What role did that play in this? Okay. Want to go back to Titanic? Yeah. What you're doing there, please. 
just, yeah, they, they go together. Yes, they do. Okay, <clears throat> the Titanic was built to be sunk. It was built in a Protestant port in Northern Ireland by the name of Belfast. They built, it, was, it was financed by J.P. Morgan. Remember, J.P. Morgan was the Vatican banker for America at this time. He was the one that the Jesuits used to control the banking in the U.S. They also controlled Rockefeller. Andrew Carnegie was really nothing. Uh, J.P. Morgan bought Andrew Carnegie's whole steel industry for $100 million less than what it was worth. Mm -hmm. Okay, So we're going to blame Rockefeller and we're going to blame J.P. Morgan, those two high-level Freemasons. And I say J.P. Morgan was a Knight of Malta, he was Episcopalian, J.P. Morgan died in Rome in a tremendously expensive hotel mm -hmm. in 1913 or so. He died before the Federal Reserve Act was passed. So <clears throat> the Titanic was built and financed by J.P. Morgan, the White Star Line. He, he controlled all the ships, the, the Olympus, the Titanic, and one other one. Britannica. Britannica, thank you. Well, <clears throat> Britannia. 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 Britannia was the encyclopedia. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so what happens is they built the Titanic to be sunk. It only went out on like an eight-hour <coughs> maiden voyage and brought it back real quickly. Mm -hmm. It was not seaworthy. Okay. The other thing is the Titanic was sold. The the uh, the, uh, the rooms in the Titanic were sold ahead of time to the most the wealthiest men in England and America that were targeted to be on it. There's a book called The Conspiracy of the Titanic, which shows you that it was in fact a conspiracy to sink the ship, and there were 55 men who refused to show up and board Titanic before it left Queenstown. 55. One of them was J.P. Morgan. He was with his harlot mistress in France and refused to leave what he was doing there. The other one was Milton Hershey of Hershey Chocolate. Okay. Another one was Vanderbilt. He refused to get on it. <laughs> so this is all bait for the wealthy men who are not part of the conspiracy, and particularly the Jews, John Jacob Astor, Isidore Strauss, and Benjamin Guggenheim. Because it's wealthy Jews at this time who are opposing the establishment of the Federal Reserve Bank. And in a, a particular book, um, called Morgan Financier by a lady, I can't remember her name, Morgan Financier. She says, Jean Strauss, Jean Strauss, Morgan Financier, she, she quotes Louis Brandeis by saying that the Federal Reserve should never be passed, the Federal Reserve Act, and that it's a pact with the devil. So here's a Jew who's a Supreme Court justice opposing the establishment of the Federal Reserve Bank. And his close friend, is John Jacob Astor, who's on the ship and the wealthiest man on board. Right? Isidore Strauss, he's the head of Macy's in New York. Benjamin Guggenheim, another wealthy Jew, he has a Guggenheim Museum in New York City. These Jews were all against the establishment of the Federal Reserve Bank because they knew it would be controlled by the Vatican. We're never taught that. So as a result, all these guys get on the Titanic, the Jesuit temple coadjutor uh, Smith, Edward Smith with his first mate, and others are there with the Jesuit for a day and a night, and the Jesuit, whose name is Francis M. Brown, who was sent by his uncle, who was the bishop of Queenstown, and Francis M. Brown has another brother who's a Jesuit, and he was given a camera to take picture of all the targets on Titanic. And so for a day and a night, Francis M. Brown takes pictures of Astor and Guggenheim and everybody on board first class so that after they sink the ship, they can process the pictures and have a party. Because now we just eliminate all of our adversaries. You mean to tell me that Francis M. Brown deliberately sailed into an 80 square mile field of icebergs? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you see he's under oath. He's under the Jesuit oath. That I do promise and swear 
to kill all heretics. He had to use the poison cup, the flagellation, the, uh, the, the knife, the, uh, the, the steel of the poniard, the leaden bullet, or the strangulation cord, as I am directed to do my, by my superior of the holy faith, of the holy society of Jesus. They're all under oath. All the, all the ship, all the guys on the ship, because you see, there was a strike in England, a, a shipper strike, and the guys who were normally going to be on the Titanic were on strike. So the Jesuits took their guys and put them on the Titanic. And Edward Smith was a Jesuit coadjutor for years. And there was another guy, McElroy, he, his brother was a priest. They're all there ready to kill everybody on that ship because it is for ad majorium de gloria, for the greater glory of God. And including themselves. Including themselves. Baptism of blood. Because, because salvation by works will lead a man to do anything. If I am a priest and I tell you, for you to have the forgiveness of sin, you must kill that man, you'll do it. That's why salvation by works is such a damnable doctrine. This is the same way the Muslims are. You get 70 virgins in heaven Goodness. if you blow up the jeep. See? You may become a human bomb. It's all salvation by works. And you can get any man to do anything if he really believes he has to perform some work to do it. And the Jesuits are masters of this. So, Francis M. Brown, before the ship departs Queenstown, he gets off the ship. A lucky Jesuit leaves the ship. As he sees all those Irish Catholics getting on the ship. As he sees those Protestants get on the ship. As he sees all those little children all those helpless women get on the ship. He knows it's going to the bottom of the North Atlantic because his uncle told him so. Wow. And they do this all the time. All the time. Didn't he give the last rites to the captain before he left? He could have. Could very well have. I, I read I'm that sure. He, I read that he had done that. Is that right? I'm sure that he did because you can't find anywhere what Brown did for that day and a half. Other than he just took pictures. And by the way, if you see the National Geographic video, Secrets of the Titanic, get that, read it, and watch it. It's the one who narrates it is Jesuit Temple Coadjutor Martin Sheen. <laughs> and he says, that the lucky priest, I remember, I have a picture of Martin Sheen in my book, who's at the Jesuit novitiate in uh, Warnersville. Wow. Martin Sheen named himself Sheen after Bishop J. Fulton Sheen. Changed his name from Estevez to, to Sheen. Now, his son, though, his uh, youngest son, Charlie, yeah. he's uh, real big against the New World Order. Is that kind of strange, isn't it? That's yeah. all a joke. That's <laughs> all for our consumption. Yeah. If he was really against it, that would be the end of his acting career. It would be the end of him in Hollywood. And his father would tell him, Martin or Charlie, if you oppose these men, they're going to kill you. Do you want to die? Because Martin knows all about him. That's why he's on the West Wing. Martin in the West Wing program, he's the Jesuit president. That's what he is. That's what the Jesuits are portraying him as. Okay. So now, the Titanic sails out to sea, 80 mile iceberg. There's a fire going on below where the coal is. So they make sure the thing's going to sink. It hits the iceberg, they keep going. They don't stop. And according to one particular report, the cap, the, the guy who was at the wheel, swung the ship to broadside so it would hit the, the, the iceberg, and you never, never expose your ship, your broadside of your ship, to any danger. You only to take it on the nose. Mm -hmm. They violated basic safety procedures because they wanted to sink that ship. And so they sunk it. And all those innocent poor people died. And uh, as a result then, the Jesuits were able to ram through their Federal Reserve Act the following year, because Titanic went down in 1912, 1913, December 23rd, two nights before bail mass, when all of our congressmen should have been there, who were Bible-believing men, busy at home celebrating the Merry Mass of Christ. Federal Reserve Act is put through. And that is the beginning of the end for us financially. So back to 1929. What happens in 29? Three Irish Catholics crash the stock market. And the Pope goes in with his Jesuits, 
and they buy it for pennies on the dollar. Now, now the Vatican has our entire industrial complex in its pocket so that it now can extend credit out of thin air from its Federal Reserve Bank to all the military industrial contractors, Boeing, Lockheed, McDonnell Douglas, <coughs> Chrysler, Ford, all of them, so that they can have huge military contracts to not only arm the U.S., but they're going to arm Germany and they're going to arm Russia. Remember, this American government, controlled by the Pope, has built the entire Soviet war machine and made you pay for it every April 15th. By the way, April 15th. Uh. <laughs> April 15th. Beware of the eyes of April. April 15th is when Lincoln died. The one who would have ended consolidation. April 15th is when Lincoln called out troops against the Protestant South. April 15th is when Titanic went to the bottom of the ocean. And you know how the Jesuits celebrate their April 15th? All the slaves in North America get to file income tax returns and pay income tax on their labor, on their wages. They get to fill out a 1040. They get to fill out a 1040. Which was an extension of the 1040 bonds that Lincoln established to finance part of the war. Is that right? 10 year, 40 year bonds. The 10 year, 40 year bonds. Wow. Just a coincidence. Isn't it? So that's what they've done. And so the Jesuits have a big hearty, har har laugh about that. Look at all the lemmings running to the IRS to file their tax returns every April 15th. And I'll bet they don't even know the IRS is a private corporation. I bet they don't even know that the Federal Reserve is a private bank. All those idiots think it's part of the federal government. <laughs> they laugh at us. They think we're fools and idiots. And for the most part, they're right. Yeah. The Catholic island of Puerto Rico is where it's... The Catholic island of Puerto Rico is where it's... Okay, so now, the Jesuits bring down the Titanic, they pass the Federal Reserve Act, now they have a bank where they can extend all this credit to build Nazi Germany, and, and then the FDR recognizes Stalin's Russia, and now money can pour into there, and then they can build Gorky. They can build the man Ford, uh, the car manufacturing plant in Gorky. And you know who does that? 33rd degree Freemason, Jew hating, Dearborn Independent, international Jew author or backer of all those authors, Henry Ford Sr. Henry Ford, pardon me, he gets a, an, an award from Adolf Hitler, the highest, I think it's the Order of the Black Eagle. I have a picture of it in my book for financing and helping to build the Third Reich. And, and we're going to be told that the Third Reich is against masonry when Henry Ford helps to build it? Come on! When Heimar Horace Greeley shot is the banker for, for, for uh, Hitler, and he's a 33rd degree Freemason, and yet they're going to tell us they're anti-Masonic? So Henry Ford builds Hitler's Reich, and he builds Stalin's Communist Red Russia because they are the same. They're going to persecute the Jews, they're going to kill off the Protestants, they're going to kill off nationalists, and they're going to ultimately make a way to, re to, uh, to uh, recreate Europe in a Catholic bloc. Don't oh, forget all those holy helpers at IBM. Oh yes, okay, there's uh, 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 Watson, Thomas J. Watson. Thomas J. Watson, the 33rd degree Freemason, yeah. and he is the one who, who creates these uh, machines Hollerith machines for Nazi Germany to be able to have a census and count all the Jews in Europe so we know where to go to their addresses and round them up and send them off to the camps. And Thomas J. Watson gets, a, gets that same uh, award that was given to Henry Ford, but he later gave it back, yeah, right. And he's another Mason helping to bring about the Jewish mass murder in Eurasia. And Thomas J. Watson's son, Jr., he becomes an ambassador to Stalin's Moscow with Averill Harriman that night of Malta, who signed the Lend-Lease Bill and brought in all the totally mechanized Russia. Do you realize Lend-Lease? Let's go to there. Let's go to Lend-Lease for a minute. Lend-Lease was signed into law in 1941, right after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, or after the ONI really bombed it. <clears throat> Lend-Lease, the question now arises, where did the government get all the money 
to buy all these things, these look, because remember, some 1,100 locomotives were given to Stalin's Russia. 50 million pairs of boots. I forget how many ships and tanks and trucks and cars were all financed and given to Joseph Stalin. Where'd they get all the money for that? You and I. Listen to this one. When I found this out, I could have tore the rest of my hair out. They robbed the Social Security Trust Fund and stole everything that the American people were paying into Social Security from 1933-34 to 1941. Hundreds of millions of dollars took that money and financed Lend-Lease, totally armed Stalin's Russia, and not one penny was ever paid back to the Social Security Trust Fund, and not one penny was ever paid back to the American government. There was no lending, and there was no lease. It's a giveaway. Okay? That's how they stole us. Stole everything from us. That's how they created our enemy for us to fight. And now, when I'm, in, I'm a Vietnam era guy, I'm supposed to go fight the communists in Nam when they built Soviet Russia? These guys are supposed to go to Korea and fight the Chinese and the Russians are there when the U.S. built it? Let's go to that one. Let's go to China. Mao Zedong was put in power by the State Department. He didn't come to power and lead this glorious revolution. All these people followed him. He was put in power by the State Department. And to, to keep our eyes off that, they started the Korean War in 1950. Now get a load of this. Here's, here's Formosa, right? Here's mainland China. There's a sea in between here. When the Korean War started, this Chinese general moved a million troops down to Korea to fight the Americans. Okay. Why would he move a million troops that were facing Formosa down into North Korea? Wouldn't that endanger Peking? Couldn't Chiang Kai-shek then just cross the Straits of Formosa there and attack and do away with Mao Zedong and communism and, and implement free government? Why didn't he do that? Probably because of an American Navy. That's right. The dirty sinners told the American Navy, the Seventh Fleet, to block Chiang Kai-shek so he could not go in and take over China so they could send a million Chinese down to North Korea and fight and kill somewhat 58,000, 55,000 American men for nothing. Nothing. The blood boiling yet? It ought to be. Gulf of Tonkin, same thing. It never happened. It was a lie. But that justified LBJ to start bombing Hanoi. And then the Exxon oil shippers, the Exxon freighters, they're dumping half their load in Hanoi and half their load in Saigon. No wonder the American troops were on drugs. What, what's going on here? We can't win. They're financing both sides. And they're giving us these lousy M16s a jam. When we take one hill and lose it the next day, no wonder they were on drugs. I'm not justifying it, but when you're in a war and you're, you can't win, what do you do? Trust the Lord, I'm, of course. But they put our American men there to kill them, to make, expose them to Asian orange, to demoralize them. All this the Jesuits did to us. They did this all to us. And they could have never succeeded without their dirty, high-level Shriner, 33rd degree Freemasons. Dirty Harry Solomon Truman. That's right. Knight of Malta, Dwight D. Eisenhower, with Chip Bolin and Averill Harriman, and all those Knights of Malta. Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, that pervert. Thank God he's gone. Amen. We'll see him at the great white throne and rejoice when the Lord casts him in the sea of fire for eternity. What that dirty sinner did. <clears throat> so the Jesuits were busy um, during this time in the 1920s. In the 1930s, remember, Walsh goes to Moscow. He's appointed, he appoints Stalin, the head of the Communist Party, in the 20s. In 1930, and remember, the Jesuits are starting, all this communism, anti-communism, the Red Scare. The FBI arrested 50,000 Americans in 1919. You read Kurt Gentry's uh, J. Edgar Hoover, The Man of the Secrets. He arrested 50,000 Americans on the Red Scare to impose fear and terror in us. 
that those nothings, they didn't have any manufacturing, they didn't have any ships to get here. They're going to hurt us, they're going to overthrow our country. All a justification to enhance more and more centralized power in Washington. Then, in 1933, when FDR is elected with the help of Knight of Malta Joseph Kennedy, Knight of Malta Ed Flynn, and Knight of Malta John J. Raskob, who was one of the heads of DuPont, and do, what's DuPont? It's a huge munitions manufacturing industry that, that made billions during World War I. John J. Raskob was also with General Motors. You realize that three, the three major car manufacturers right. are all Catholic. All high-level Freemasons and Knights of Malta. General Motors, Chrysler, and Ford, all run by the Vatican. They ran out Studebaker. They ran out all the other competitors that were making better cars so that they have a monopoly. Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi's run by Vatican. It was, uh, it was Emperor Komi. Uh, I think it was Emperor Komi, another son. That entered into alliance with one of these noble Japanese families, and Mitsubishi was one of them. So all these noble families of Japan and America and Germany, they have these monopolies. They're all papal knights. There is no free enterprise. There is no true competition where I can make a better car for a cheaper price. They made it all a monopoly to wreck the middle class. And if that's not enough, they're going to throw the unions in there. They're going to, now, union's a good thing if it's a local in-shop union. But when you centralize union and you have them all in there and all the Teamsters are all run by the Mafia and the money the, team, the, team, the guys pay in never gets to them. So the Jesuits are then busy and in 1933 FDR recognizes Russia. You know what that recognition means? That means they can send all of our technology to Russia. And I have this terrible heart-rending story in my book about Victor Herman. You want to remember this Jew, Victor Herman. Victor Herman, his father Sam, they really believed in Russia. They thought it was a place that Jews could go to be free, to, to not be persecuted. So Henry Ford sent 300 Americans up on a ship over to Russia to, build, to man the Gorky factory and to start producing these cars on a 10-year lease for these workers. Before the 10 years is up, Stalin starts the purchase. Every American was killed in the gulag system, murdered, raped, plundered, except Victor Herman. And he survived and was able to come back. And it's a book you, want, you have to read. It's called Coming Out of the Ice. Coming Out of the Ice by Victor Herman. He had to live in a chop out for 10, I forget how many years, with his wife and little girl. Who is it by him? Victor Herman. He also wrote another book called The Gray People. And if you want to read the savage, sexual tortures and horrible things that those guards put those women through, you have to get the book The Gray People. It is so awful that I will not repeat it in mixed company. But you need to see what they are going to do to you when they do the same thing here that they did in Russia. All financed by Henry Ford, American cartel capitalists, making that all possible. Victor Herman tells that one day he had to load a whole, a whole train car full of wood. And if he didn't load it, he couldn't go back to the barracks. And of course, it's freezing and he's freezing and he does this in the snow. So he manages to do it a certain way. And as he's trying to get it done, he looks over to a guard. And he sees what the guard's eating out of. And he starts weeping and crying. And what he tells the reader is what he saw the guard eating out of was an American can of pork and beans. Here's this Victor Herman. He's an American. He has the world free fall record in Russia. Jumped out of a plane at 50,000 feet. He survives. He's known as the Charles Lindbergh of Russia. FDR knows all about him. Henry Ford knows all about him. You think they bring him back here? No, he's a stinking Jew. So they're going to leave him there. And he tells in his story he ate 130 raw rats to live. 
He used to go where the dead bodies were, where the cadavers were, and he built a rat trap to catch these rats, and he'd drown it, and then he'd eat these raw rats, because if he didn't do that, he would die. That's how he survived. And finally, he came out. And when he came out here, he came back to the U.S. And I have a picture of him confronting uh, one of the Ruther brothers. He was a Jesuit. And Victor Herman was hounded by the FBI and the KGB until he died in the 1980s. But you must read his book, Coming Out of the Ice. All treason on the part of our government and the corporate cartel fascists that run the business in this country. Okay, so, <clears throat> and while FDR is going to recognize the sovereign state of, uh, recognize Russia, the man sitting next to him is Edmund Walsh. You must remember this name, Edmund A. Walsh. Edmund Walsh is a Georgetown Jesuit. He is the creator of the School of Foreign Service. George J. Tennant went to the School of Foreign Service. At this School of Foreign Service, all of our future leaders in foreign policy are trained. And thus they are controlled by the Jesuits. The State Department is manned by a whole bunch of grads from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Right? That's right. Dostert, who was a Jesuit, who, who was the one who perfected translation through, through uh, when someone is speaking another language and translated into your ears. Dostert was taken... Pardon? Interpreter. Interpreter, but it was an automatic translation. I mean, it was an interpreter, but... But at Nuremberg, it's Edmund J. Walsh, Edmund A. Walsh, who's at Nuremberg, along with his right-hand man, Dostert, and they're the ones responsible for all the translation that goes on at Nuremberg, so that these Nazis, whenever they bring up the issue of the papacy, and a conquered out with the Pope, and the priests involved in the SS, they will not, they will be all censored out. Do they have the... Do they still have the German transcripts of that? I don't know. Or are they gone? They're probably gone. They all censor it out. The other thing was, Edmund Walsh was one who worked with Robert Jackson. Robert Jackson was a 33rd degree Freemason. He was a Supreme Court Justice. He was a prosecutor. And don't you know who they decided to prosecute and who they did not decide to prosecute? They didn't prosecute Hitler because, of course, they helped him to escape. You must read uh, Hansik's work, Hitler's Escape. H-A-N-S-I-G, Hansik. You, uh, they didn't prosecute Hitler because the British Secret Service helped him escape. And they killed instead a man named Heinrich Hittinger. They didn't prosecute uh, Bormann because they had him escape. And they didn't prosecute Heinrich Mueller because, you see, Bormann and Mueller were working with the Red Orchestra, with the NKVD, during the war. That's why the German troops on the East were betrayed and sacrificed in the East by von Paulus. So at Nuremberg, you have Edmund Walsh there, who is a Knight of Malta and a high Jesuit. And what do they do? Well, they're censoring out the transcripts. But he also lets another man go. Jesuit Edmund Walsh lets a man go by the name of Karl Haushofer. He was the geopolitical man that Himmler, that Hitler followed in all of his takings. He takes Austria, then he takes the Sudetenland, then he takes all of Czechoslovakia without firing a shot. Mm -hmm. And then he takes Poland and then begins World War II. But all of that whole plan was the master plan of the Jesuit, Karl Haushofer. Karl Haushofer, his death was faked. He did not commit suicide after the war, and Edmund Walsh let him live. He refused to prosecute him, because Walsh was a, probably at least a colonel in the army. So here's a stinking Jesuit who's a colonel in the army who has all this power over the Nuremberg procedures. And if that's not enough, uh, Walsh then goes to Japan. And he's now part of the International War Crimes Tribunal in Tokyo. And guess what? They don't prosecute Hirohito, the emperor. The emperor was the one responsible for the Pearl Harbor attack, at least on the Japanese side. He was a high-level Freemason with FDR. 
Both their Masonic brothers working together to cause Pearl Harbor, to cause this war, for the total destruction of Japan, so that it could be brought out of its dark ages and made a commercial colony for the Pope's Holy Roman 14th Amendment American Empire. And that's one reason why the Japanese hate us. Instead of defeating Hirohito and putting him to putting him on trial and, and executing all his, those criminals and letting Japan be who it was, oh no, we got to subjugate the Japanese. We got to we can't let them have any weapons. We got to have them totally disarmed. That crime. And leave Hirohito in there. Yeah, leave Hirohito in there. Yes. Uh, is there anything significant about uh, the transformation and the changes in the vice presidency under FDR? Um, he goes through like almost four of them, doesn't he? Yes, he does. And it's interesting that Truman becomes the one, and he you know, shortly dies thereafter. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the big difference between he used to have to vote for the vice president and for the president, and all of a sudden now, whoever the president is basically chooses the vice president, uh -huh. and you get the whole kit and the right. Remember the 17th Amendment, we were not supposed to vote for the president anyway. The choosing of the president was a state issue. Right. The choosing of the senators was a state issue. But that is significant because I show in my book that FDR was poisoned and that Dirty Harry Truman, that's what my Japanese missionary friend called him, Brother Daniel Fuji. He was there in Japan and, and he was a Japanese soldier at the time. He said, all of us in Japan, we hated, we hated Truman. He said, he said that when the movie came out of Dirty Harry, he said we thought the movie was coming out of Dirty Truman. <laughs> 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 that's funny. But, uh, so you don't think FDR would have dropped the bombs? Oh, no. Harry no bombs were dropped, my brother. There is no such thing as airborne nuclear war. That is all a lie. That's right. What happened was this. And it took me about two years, two and a half years to confirm this. You'll like this story. And I'll tell you the story of the Indianapolis. You'll like that one, too when they fed those U.S. sailors to the sharks on the feast of Ignatius Loyola on Jan July 31st. Yeah. Okay, what happens is this. Never has an atomic device prior to 1943, because that's when they really did need their first one, 1943, ever been dropped and airburst. It's never been done. And remember, the Jesuit order is a military order. It's not a bunch of religious people. They're warriors. They're like the Templars. They're like the Hospitallers. They're like any highly disciplined military. They're better than the SEALs. They have absolute obedience. And whatever they're told to do, they've had adequate training and absolute obedience to carry it out. There's no one like them. Do you think the Black Pope, the Jesuit general, would use a weapon in a way that he had never tested it? Never. It's not a military. You always use a weapon after you've tested it a certain way. And prior to 1943, when the, 1943 was really the first one that I know of, Dr. Bill Deagle says 1939, some say Tunguska in Russia was a nuclear detonation. It could very well have been, which was what, 1908, something like that. That no air bursting bomb of a nuclear type was ever dropped. So this is what the Jesuits did. They knew that this was going to work on July 16, 1945, when they detonated their bomb with the Trinity testing in Alamogordo. Okay? They knew it was going to work. The very day they detonated, they sent the USS Indianapolis out of port, out of San Francisco, with uranium slugs. There is no bomb on the US, USS Indianapolis. And I recommend you get the book called Enola Gay by Paul Tibbetts. And he tells you about this. They send the USS Indianapolis, it's full steaming ahead to Tinian Island. And it's very interesting, it's not zigzagging either. Which tells you that the Office of Naval Intelligence and Japanese intelligence are working together to make sure the USS Indianapolis gets to Tinian Island. Because Tinian Island is where the B-29s are that are going to be used to fly over Japan with their, with their devices. So what happens is they arrive at uh, Tinian, they unload their cargo, and then some, and then some days on uh, July, August 6th, Paul Tibbetts takes off in the Enola Gay, and they insert the uranium slug 
in the bomb when it's in flight. Hmm. Sounds a little funny to me. I would think it would be all ready to go. So they insert the slug into, I believe it was Fat Man. Fat Man, a little boy. And it's uranium. The one that over, over Nagasaki, they use plutonium. So they insert it in the bomb. They drop the bomb and it air bursts, sending a huge flash of light and bits of uranium going everywhere. So it looks like an atomic blast has happened. But what's happened is this is a magnesium flash bomb. It is not an atomic bomb. It's a magnesium flash bomb loaded with radioactive uranium to make it look like a nuclear detonation has taken place as an airburst. Because what we know now is that atomic devices do not detonate in motion. The whole triad we have of submarines, missiles is one great big lie. We do not have any nuclear defenses. All we have are preset nuclear devices in place on location that have to be detonated at a certain time because now we're going to have to get into the concept that the earth revolving around the sun is a lie. The earth does not revolve around the sun. The sun revolves around the earth. It's called geocentricity. And when you believe that and understand that, now you can understand how to detonate an atomic bomb. Because you can only detonate an atomic bomb at certain times when the sun is in the right harmonic relationship to the earth as it's going around the earth. And here's how we have our seasons. You have the earth, you have the Tropic of Cancer, the equator, the Tropic of Capricorn. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west and it goes like this, up and down in a screw tight fashion. When it's up in the Tropic of Cancer, we have summer. When it goes down, we have fall in the equator. Yeah, summer, yeah, summer. When it's the Tropic of Cancer, we have spring. When it's down in the equator, we have summer. When it's down in the Tropic of Capricorn, we, we're getting winter. When it's coming back up, we're getting uh, what part of fall, then winter, then back up. But anyway, we see it as it's going up and down. First, for, first your spring, uh, your, your fall, then your winter, then your spring, and then your summer as it's going up and down like this. Which also brings on another concept. There is such a thing as perpetual motion. Because the sun is in perpetual motion, and the moon is in perpetual motion, and the laws of physics that sustain perpetual motion can be used for you to build an electromagnetic machine to keep your home warm. And that's how the Jesuits run all their underground military installations. They use no fossil fuel. Everything is electromagnetism. A bad Tesla coil. Tesla coil is, is part of it, but it's not generating electricity. It uses electricity. It's very effective. So we'll get back to Japan. They drop the bomb out of Enola Gate. It air bursts. And guess who's on the ground? <laughs> you must get the Jesuits by Malachi Martin. He will tell you what happens. The betrayal of the Roman Catholic Church. On the ground is a man named Pedro Arupe. Pedro Arupi has about eight other Jesuits, has, has a Jesuit house that he's running there in Hiroshima. And five of those Jesuits are nuclear physicists. One of them's name is, is Kleinsorge. He's a German. And what they're busy doing is assembling the atomic device months before this happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's why the Allies never bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Because if they would have bombed those cities, those triggers, those beryllium triggers are very sensitive and it would have screwed up the whole device and they wouldn't have had a successful detonation. So what happens is, as they, as, as, uh, they fly over Hiroshima, they get in the general vicinity because the targeting was goofy and they couldn't be precise with it. They drop this magnesium flash bomb and on the ground the Jesuits are there and they're underneath of it because they know how to shield it. So the bomb goes out and it goes up but there's no crater. 
And in, when they tested this in New Mexico, you know at the deepest part, um, when they detonated their bomb in New Mexico, at the most the critical mass, you know how deep it was? Six feet. That's all. That's it? Find it. They know how to shield it. So they shield it and erosion going to go out and up. That's what happened. There is no evidence that any bomb has ever air dropped an airburst ever. None. I know it's a hard one for a lot of you, and it's, and it's even harder for the concept of geocentricity. But remember, we have been trained all wrong. Everything they ever taught us was wrong. Everything. Our health, science, law, physics, everything they ever taught us was all wrong. And they've kept us down by this false knowledge. So now, after they've done this, the Jesuits detonate this device, and you know what Pedro Rupi gets out of this? They do the same thing three days later at Nagasaki. You know what he gets out of this? 1965, he becomes a Jesuit general. Wow. He killed 90,000 Japanese. He did. We didn't. They did. And they blamed it on us. And the Japanese hate our guts. For, for supposedly dropping those bombs because it was not necessary. They offered terms of surrender three weeks before that, and the only term was you let us keep our emperor. They got to keep their emperor anyway. Dirty sinners. So now we get to bear the brunt of what the Jesuits did to the Japanese people by detonating those devices. And I tell you this, the Jesuits are going to do this again. They have at least 100 atomic devices preset in this country. And when the window of opportunity comes, there's a book you might want to get on this, it's called Harmonic 33 by Bruce, Bruce Cathy, C-A-T-H-I-E, he was an Australian pilot. And he tells of that it is impossible to conduct airborne nuclear war. His book was never answered, Harmonic 33. They have these devices already in this country, ready to detonate at a certain specific time. And they've been here for no less than 20 or 30 years. Because as we, as we shall see, we have an international intelligence community. The CIA works together with the KGB, the British SIS, with the Chinese Secret Service, with the Israeli Mossad, with all of it. They all work together. The low ends, the guys on the low ends are busy killing each other. But on the top, they're all working together and orchestrating it all. Interpol. All run by the Vatican. Yes. Did you know anything, uh, when I talked to Ralph Epperson, he, was, he made the statement that there's not another country in the world that has a nuclear device that we either have not given them uh, or that has not been our property. That's his contention. That oh, there sure. are no nuclear devices outside of ours. Well, uh, the nuclear device was given to Joseph Stalin in 1943. They have to go. But he was saying as long as like one of our guys went with it. Yeah. We, well, one of our guys that went with it was part of the international intelligence community. So there's, so the threat, there's no such thing as airborne nuclear war, missiles coming in and blowing us to King so of Star Wars was a joke. It's a joke. Mm -hmm. So could you put a nuclear missile, I mean a, a, a warhead on a missile and have it land and blow up? No. It has to be stationary. It has to be on the ground because what detonates those devices is a very, very sensitive trigger. And it's made out of beryllium. And I show in my book Michael, Michael Delisle Lyons who had a Q clearance along with another Jesuit at St. Louis University. And he was the real designer and builder of this beryllium trigger that was used to detonate the device in, in uh, New Mexico and ultimately in Japan. The Jesuits have the Q clearance. They devise a trigger, and these triggers are very, very <coughs> sensitive, and they cannot be hit or bumped because if that is broken very easily, they're not going to do it. That's why they didn't bomb. Just go out and read your Japan, read the World War II history, and see that Curtis LeMay never sent any B-29s to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Hiroshima had 90,000 Japanese troops there. Why wouldn't he bomb it? I would have. Sure. I'd bomb any troops that were going to kill my men right now. They didn't bomb it. Why? Because they were building a device, and it was their baby, and they couldn't hurt it, so that it would work. Now, here's what I say is going to be done. We have, because of this international intelligence community, 
that we have now, all working together, all run by the Knights of Malta, uh, and the FSB, and the SDR in Russia, the CIA, the, C the FBI, all of them run by the Knights of NSA. There are nuclear devices, small atomic devices that have been given to Bin Laden. Suitcase nukes? Little, little balls, little suitcase nukes. Not, not a real high yield, but enough to destroy Mecca, enough to destroy Medina, and any other mosque they want to use to destroy the Islamic quote-unquote holy sites. As a nuclear device, as a special atomic device was used in the basement of the World Trade Center, which stayed hot for at least another 30 days, as that was put there and brought down the World Trade Center and blamed the Muslims for that, Bin Laden, who are high-level Freemasons working with the Knights of Malta, they're going to detonate Me Mecca and Medina and going to blame it on us. And that will create an Islamic jihad, holy war against us until we are all killed. They will come here by the millions. And that's exactly what they want because now China has a... Am I boring people? No. Because China has a, geo, a geopolitical agreement with um, Dakar, uh, Mediterranean there on the west coast of Africa, so that all their Costco and ships can come right over into Cuba and the Bahamas and ferry all these Muslims over here so that they can arm themselves in Cuba and the Bahamas and then prepare for their invasion up into Florida and the south. Where do you see the Chinese coming in? Chinese are going to be involved too. They're going to do all that they have their shipping at Costco. Do you see that with the uh, this 1,200-foot wide airstrip that they're building up the center of the United States? The, the NAFTA highway. The NAFTA highway? I don't see it there, but it could very well be because I say in my book, it's a Sino-Chinese Soviet Muslim invasion. They're all going to be working together. They were all built by the U.S. For the purpose, they armed them not to protect themselves. They didn't arm the Arab countries to protect themselves. They didn't arm Turkey to protect itself against Russia. They armed the Turks to come against us. And the Turks are savages. When they kill, when they fight, they cut off your ear and they make a necklace out of it. And they did, they have their necklaces dancing around and it smells gross and all kinds of other stuff. They're savages. When they come here, it's for keeps. And they're going to bring the Turks into this through the destruction of Mecca and Medina, I believe. Because if I was the Jesuit general, that's exactly what I'd do. I want to destroy every remnant of what was ever white Anglo-Saxon Protestant civilization because I want to kill the Reformation and I want to kill all those Muslims nations that are forbidding me to rebuild the third temple for the Pope of my choosing. Because when they rebuild that third temple, all those Muslim nations that are against us, they got to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. they got to be eliminated. That's why they're planning the 30 years war. So that's what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, let me tell you about what happened after that. The USS Indianapolis came over here, delivered the uranium slug. They used it in Hiroshima. US Indianapolis departs port. It's supposed to go back to, I think it's San Francisco. As it's going back, the captain, Captain Charles McVeigh, the only sea captain of the entire war that was ever court-martialed, and he's set up by that stinking Admiral Nimitz, that traitor. He sets up McVeigh, working with the Japanese intelligence so that a Japanese sub is waiting for the USS Indianapolis at night. It's waiting. Because they work together at Pearl Harbor, they can work together now. Now, here comes the USS Indianapolis. It's not zigzagging like it's supposed to, but it's at night. They don't think that's a problem. Immediately, wham, wham, two torpedoes. And the Japanese, when they shoot a torpedo, then it was manned. There's a driver on that torpedo. After those two detonations, there's two more torpedoes. That's two serious, more. That's serious business. That's there, serious buddy. business. That's right. There's two more detonations, and the, and the USS Indianapolis, I think, sunk in something like 
12 minutes, 15 minutes, something like that. For four, and this is on July, what, 31st, 1945. Guess what day is the feast of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits? July 31st. So as the Jesuits and all their community houses are busy celebrating the feast of Ignatius Loyola and having the most luxurious food out there before them to eat and have a wonderful celebration, they just decided to send about five or six hundred American sailors to have, give them, make them a feast of the sharks. And they were in water for four days, four days, before finally, by the grace of God, an American pilot flew over and saw this huge oil slick and they finally saw these men down there and they rescued them. They killed our guys. They sacrificed our guys and they deliberately didn't send out any search party for four days. Where's the USS Indianapolis? We have no message. They sacrificed them. They court martialed Charles McVeigh and they bring the Japanese subby, the just Japanese sub captain, over to his court martial to test him. This broke McVeigh. He died a broken man. He committed suicide, shot himself in the mouth, and they found in his hand a little sailor, a little toy sailor. I tell you, these people have no mercy. They will do anything. Is there any relation between that McVeigh and another McVeigh? Timothy? No, I don't think so. This is Charles McVeigh III. So that's how they ended. They got rid of the Indianapolis. They got rid of anybody that needed to be eliminated who knew too much. And uh, how many men came out of the water? In, in I the think area? it was 500, so 300 maybe. How many men? Twelve hundred. I think they lost something like 700. And if you ever saw the movie Jaws, the first Jaws, the captain in there talks about the Indianapolis. Mm -hmm where the tiger sharks were biting men in half. And that's exactly what was happening. The see, the Jesuits were bragging in Jaws 1, because we did that. We we're the one that's sinking in Apis, and we're the ones that sacrificed all those soldiers. They're bragging through their movies. Okay. So now, um, the Jesuits then, as, as we understand this last century, it's very important that we see that there's no such thing as other sides. They're all working together. So back to the Jesuits in the, um, in the 1700s, they were suppressed for this very reason. They had all this power. They controlled all the kings. They controlled all the banking. They controlled all the reductions. And so as a result, the king of Spain, the king of France, and the king of Portugal suppressed them. Does everybody want to continue, or shall I end? Keep going? What time is it? Does anybody want to stretch, use the bathroom? If anybody wants to stretch, use the bathroom, you can come back. Or Take five minutes. Take care of our mind. Okay. Corey, you just